Brad Newcomb, and you are watching Pressure Point. We live in a world that is torn by conflict, and a lot of it is based on ethnicity and religion. That's why it's good to hear about people who work together. We don't often hear about the World Council of Churches, but it's an organization that began in 1948 and includes over 300 denominations. And I'm really thrilled to have as my guest one of the vice moderators of the World Council of Churches, BC's own Dr. Marion Best. Marion, it is really good to have you here. Thanks, Brad. Yeah, and one of the great things is, of course, we've known each other for a long, long time. Long time. So it's nice to have a visit. Uh, we don't hear much about the World Council of Churches in the news. Um, so maybe briefly, just tell me what it is and what does it do? Well, the World Council of Churches um, is a fellowship of churches who come together in an assembly once every seven years. A lot of people will remember the assembly in Vancouver in 83. And uh, at that time, when they come together, they look at the programs that have been carried on in the last seven years, decide on a program emphasis for the next seven, and uh, elect a governing body. Essentially, so, that's what an assembly does. So what kind of programs? Are you, like, say, in the last few years, what kind of programs are we well, talking about? Well, one that I think a lot of people would know about was the decade uh, of the churches in solidarity with women in church and society. And that decade ended in uh, 1998. And at this assembly that was held in Zimbabwe in December, another decade has been declared, and it's uh, called the Decade to Overcome Violence, Churches Seeking Peace and Reconciliation. And I think that's very significant. That decade uh, will go from 2001 to 2010, and is designed to coincide with the United Nations decade that has concern about what's happening to children caught up in conflicts around the world. Okay, and, and well, I mean, that is a very timely thing. Mm -hmm. Because in the last few years, we have seen some of the most horrific conflicts of, that yeah. we saw in the 20th century, and, and as we go into the, as we are in the 21st century, um, it doesn't look that promising. No. Have you done anything, for instance, Kosovo, East Timor, Rwanda? I mean, those are so traumatizing. Does the World Council of Churches get involved? Mm -hmm. And maybe you could say a little bit more if you know anything about the impact on children. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> first of all, the, um, the relief work, the emergency relief type work, is done through an organization called ACT. Action of Churches Together, which is the World Council of Churches and the Lutheran World Federation together. And uh, right now, Rod Booth is actually in Kosovo. Rod Booth being a United Church minister mm -hmm. and was the host of this program. That's right. And Rod has taken a contract to be the information officer for this organization called ACT that's in Kosovo now. And uh, we've been receiving emails from Rod regularly. And the kind of thing that they're doing is uh, helping with the demining uh, the whole landmine situation is terrible there. Uh, they are trying to rebuild schools. They've uh, built 600 uh, prefab houses recently. They're clearing wells. Um, unfortunately, they've discovered in some of the well clearing that there were bodies that have been uh, put into wells during uh, the offensive. And um, it's, it's really a horrific situation and trying to race against the weather closing in. And, uh, and this is in Kosovo. In Kosovo. Mm -hmm. I, I've read mm -hmm. some things, some reports, and it is hard to believe that human beings could treat other human beings that. Yeah. I've read similar stories from East Timor and Rwanda. Yeah. One of the things that would be an example in terms of Kosovo is the Orthodox Church in Albania which didn't even exist for 50 years under the communist regime. There was no public worship. And the Orthodox Church in Albania started up again in the 90s. And we had the Archbishop of that church with us in September when we met. And he talked about how the Kosovars, most of whom were Muslim, coming out of Kosovo, concerned about how they would be received in Albania by any Orthodox people, fleeing, they felt, from a a nation that was um, Serbian Orthodox in many ways. And uh, he talked about how the Orthodox Church thought, we will stand by and pray about the situation. And he said, we couldn't do only that. 
we see the face of Christ in the suffering of the people and talked about how these Orthodox families took Muslim families into their homes. And he also talked about how World Council and other uh, churches around the world had contributed to help them and they actually provided refugee assistance to 20,000 people in Albania, which is the poorest country in Europe. I mean, that's one of the examples. And of course, an example that we don't often hear too much about because we understandably hear about uh, the news breaking, you know, horrific stories, but yeah. sometimes the good news gets lost yeah. amongst such terrible news. And in East Timor as well, um, one of the things the World Council does in those trouble spots is to send in teams to, uh, to visit the situation and see what's happening. They did that after the riots in uh, Indonesia uh, in the spring last year and uh, also made visits in July. While we were actually meeting in Geneva late August, early September this year, the referendum was being held in East Timor and there were several Indonesians pleading that the United Nations would send a peace keeping group to have it there on the spot when the results of the referendum mm -hmm. were announced. And of course that didn't happen. The World Council made a plea to the, to the UN, it took a good two weeks before anyone came in there and in the meantime there was we some, know this terrible massacre. what happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 almost a kind of betrayal of, of people's hope and courage yeah. you know, in voting for democracy. One of the hopeful signs, too, is that uh, when the World Council group went there to visit in July, they met with uh, groups, uh, particularly groups of women who were both Muslim Christian women who have come together to be in solidarity around what's happening. And unfortunately, um, uh, women and children are the victims. Um, we had a speaker from the UN, uh, Mr. Otono, who gave this statistic, which I found incredible. In the First World War, 5% of the casualties were civilians. In the Second World War, 45% were. Now, in the conflicts that are going on, 90% of the casualties are civilian, and that's women, children, and the elderly primarily, mm -hmm. which is very shocking. Child soldiers, uh, 15 is uh, supposed to be the age for conscription, but there are all kinds of 10, 11 year old children, many of whom have been drug induced, who um, uh, carry small arms, and um, many of the arms manufacturers are so pleased because they are producing lighter and lighter arms that uh, young children can carry. You mentioned drug induced, I've heard of that. Mm -hmm. Say a little more about that. Does that mean that, is that what sort of almost enables people to? Uh, per perpetrate such horrific yes, crimes? Yes. Because they they've they're desensitized yes, by alco drugs? Yes, alcohol and drug uh, for these children. And uh, one of the things that child soldiers, it's not uncommon, and this was the case certainly in, uh, in Sierra Leone, was that in order to prove yourself, you had to kill some members of your family in order to be accepted into uh, into the the child army and and it's ju it is horrific it's terrible and one of the things we're pushing for is to have 18 as the minimum age for for soldiers rather than 15 but to really speak out against the child soldiers and that's what the UN is committed to as well wow well that brings us to i suppose the whole nature of of uh men and women being human, hmm. and the questions about faith. Mm -hmm. um, maybe tell me a little bit about your journey of faith. I, I know that your background has been a nurse in mm -hmm. uh, the interior of British Columbia, a mother and grandmother, and here you are, a past moderator of the United Church of Canada and a vice moderator of the World Council of Churches. Say a little bit about how you got here. <laughs> Mainly through teaching Sunday school. <laughs> good, <laughs> Taught Sunday school for a good many years. You know, in the days when I think there was a lot of energy being put by our church into uh, training people in leadership roles. Uh, Naramata Center was very formative for me. For 30 years, uh, Naramata Center has been an important part of my life. And uh, when I worked, you know, I worked at Naramata Center, and in the middle 1980s, I had a study leave and decided to apply for what was called a Christian lay leadership training program that was being held in Tanzania, in Africa. I'd never been out of North America. 
went to, to Tanzania and uh, was kind of scary getting on a plane and getting off the plane yeah. in Dar es Salaam. Like <laughs> Will anybody meet me? And um, there were 30 of us from around the world and we lived pretty much as the people live there and uh, same food, uh, same kind of accommodation and it was a very amazing experience for me. <clears throat> I think first of all I discovered how little it's possible to get along with. <laughs> came home and wondered why do I have so much stuff. <laughs> um, came to appreciate the African people, particularly the women, I must say, uh, the, the strength of their faith and, uh, and just the amazing way they have community together. And people have often been surprised when I've said, you know, I laughed more when I was there than I often do at home. Now why? I don't know. It was, it was something about that sense of community and, um, and people just, just being together with no, no amenities as we think of them. You know, you lived with the very simplest of things and just simply enjoyed one another. And that was, that was an amazing experience for me. So from there, um, I ended up chairing the Interchurch Interfaith Committee of the United Church. I worship in a shared ministry, Anglican United. They thought they were going to be on the forefront of church union back mm. in the 70s. Right. Okay. And when it didn't happen, just said, we're going to stay together anyway. So we're one congregation, alternate between a united and Anglican minister every four or five years. And so my interest in that, and um, uh, my oldest daughter had converted to Judaism some over 20 years ago. So I had an interest in interfaith. And um, so those things, I think, were what led me to chair the Interchurch Interfaith Committee. Through that, I became a delegate to a World Council Assembly, and there I got elected to the Central Committee in 1991, and uh, have just continued uh, to be part of it. So you're, you're in, a, in a very diverse group, over 300 church oh, denomina yes. Christian denominations yeah. uh, in the World Council of Churches. You're a woman. You're the vice moderator of the World Council of Churches. You have never been ordained to particular orders. Um, how do uh, people react to you? And I'm thinking particularly, there's often some pretty entrenched male clergy uh, who sometimes, you know, change <laughs> is not the first thing that comes to yeah. mind. I think sometimes, uh, I, the only time that I remember it being raised was when they learned that I'd been elected moderator of my church. Mm. And they could not understand how, many of them couldn't understand how a church could elect a lay person to be moderator. And then when they heard that I could administer the sacraments at a general council meeting, they just really couldn't understand that at all. And then they, they got very self-conscious about what they should call me. You know, because uh, titles seem to be so important. So I just, well, you know, you just keep calling me what you've always called me. Which was. But, they, you know, well, it's yeah. just, I've yeah. always just gone by Mary and Beth there. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, That's what I like too. I mean, yeah. Brad, Mary, and Mary. Yeah. That's how we're born. But it just seemed as though um, th there should be a very reverend or a right reverend or something to go with it, you know. So that's the only time it ever got raised was some, because they do have a respect for lay people. There isn't mm -hmm. any problem with that. It was just that it seemed as though I was taking a position that rightfully belonged to an ordained person. Mm -hmm. That was the attitude uh, of some people in, uh, in the World Council. Um, I, I, think, um, I think I do bring an understanding of process and how to run a meeting that, um, that has been valued there. Um, there aren't a lot of process skills. There's a lot of good theologians, but sometimes uh, educationally or, or how to plan something, how to put something together in a way that people can really participate and understand, um, I think they valued that I have some of those skills, which I, most of which I learned at Naramata. What about as a woman and as a mother, grandmother, are there things that, uh, perspectives that you can bring uh, or others in the World Council that... Um, get through to people? Well, certainly. I've always had a concern about the women's issues. And uh, because I became active at a time when the decade of the Churches in Solidarity with Women was already underway, there was lots of scope 
for that. Um, there are some very capable, very fine women in that governing body and a lot of good young women too. So, you know, I've been able to make some good relationships and learn from those people too. Mm -hmm. In terms of children, um, yes, I think there's a combination of younger people who have children and people like me who have grandchildren who really care about the kind of world these kids are going to grow up into. So that issues like um, you know, the global warming is a major issue. Concern about HIV AIDS, there's been major studies done on that. And of course in places like Africa, I oh. mean whole generations yeah. are being decimated. One in four people are HIV positive in sub-Sahara Africa. I mean that's quite frightening. Mm. And uh, when we were in Zimbabwe, they were willing to admit for the first time exactly how many reported deaths there were from HIV AIDS. And it was over a thousand a week at wow. that time. And that had grown from 750 to a thousand. So I don't know what it will be in the future. So. I mean, I'm just struck in our conversation we talked about Kosovo and you mm -hmm. knowing people there, you're talking about Africa, you know people there, like you're meeting people at the grassroots level mm -hmm. from all around the world. How does that impact you when you come back to Canada and hear us whine? <laughs> That's my judgment, but <laughs> I mean that is my judgment because uh, you know, yeah. Yeah. do we, are we whiners? <laughs> or do we just not see it? Are we just limited well, in our vision? I, I feel badly sometimes when I go into congregations and discover them to be so insular. Um, I, I think uh, a lot of congregations do a really good job of people looking after each other. Mm -hmm. But um, what I've often encouraged people, not only to, to know more about the global situation, mm -hmm. like our Division of World Outreach in the United Church is now providing many more opportunities. Twinning, uh, you can bring, you know, twinning with a congregation in another part of the world where you really build a relationship mm -hmm. and come to know about their life. I think until you actually have those kind of encounters, I think it's hard for people to grasp. I also know that um, our main form of response is usually giving money. Mm -hmm. And people still do give generously in many ways. Um, appeals for North Korea went way over expectation. Appeals for Central Africa went way over expectation. But I would, I would wish that there was just a little more uh, real involvement the by relationship people. is really what sort of is the glue, isn't it, yeah. that, that, that makes the difference. Yeah. But it's not only global, it's also people need to know what's happening in their own communities. Yeah. Uh, I just met with a federated anti-poverty group at Naramata this week. And, uh, you know, to hear their stories about what people are up against right in our own communities around homelessness and poverty and um, how many, 800,000 people are using food banks every week. That's more than the population of Newfoundland. Mm. You know, it, it's quite shocking, but I think we have a lot of um, folks who are pretty insular and just aren't aware of what's happening in our own communities. And why isn't there more outcry about that? Oh, I know. I mean, there are so many things that we could be, uh, we should be, or could be outraged about, mm -hmm. and, and we're silent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I guess, I, so it makes me wonder, what is it that helps us to step outside ourselves? And I, ask, I have to ask that for myself yeah. first. Yeah. Because, I mean, I get as comfortable as the next person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I can also get overwhelmed. Yeah. And I can feel the pain of other people, and I don't want to feel pain uh, because I have enough just of my own. Mm -hmm. So how can I and you and others, how do we sort of make those steps? Is, is whatever, the, whatever, however big they or small they may be. Well, I think the way to go is to choose one thing. You know, even if you just choose one thing and make that the thing beyond your own congregation that you really find out about, that you um, become knowledgeable about, and that you commit some time, energy uh, toward. And, and I think it can be a growing experience for people. I mean, there are people who put all their focus on 10 days. 
10, know, when on, you say 10, ten, days, ten, ten days, 10 days for world development. For global justice, right, global justice. network, yeah. And so they will put a lot of energy into uh, studying about a particular topic. It was the garment workers this year. Mm. And um, th there's been uh, people putting energy into the, the Jubilee, the debt, Right, which is reduction of mm -hmm. debt for third world uh, countries. Speaking out against the MAI. The multilateral you know, agreement on mm -hmm. investment. Yep. So there are a lot of things, and you can't be knowledgeable about absolutely everything, but you could choose one niche, and you could gather a group of people around you and make that your focus. And I just think to go beyond your own little community is, is really helpful. And of course, I think if I often, my experience has been if you pick one thing, and focus on that, it'll have sort of little tentacles mm -hmm. and spokes that lead out to other things anyways. Yeah. So it won't keep you in one little area, but at least it helps to, you know, otherwise we can be tossed about and then get that feeling of, of being overwhelmed. I mean, there's just too many things and too many problems and it's too yeah. big, so I shut down. Yeah. I think, Brad, just to be fair, too, about World Council, one of the things that people will most remember about World Council is the worship. And uh, anybody who was uh, at the 83 assembly in Vancouver, I think, will remember that. And, and I mean, one of the purposes is to be um, in, in unity, not to be a megachurch, right. not to be one church, but to have a unity of, of the Christian church, to be a more credible witness in the world. So worship and spirituality is also a really important part of, uh, of World Council, just as it is for our congregations. And I wouldn't want it to sound as though World Council is another NGO doing good works only, that, uh, that the worship life and, um, and a lot of the conversations about what we believe and why we believe um, is, is very important. So it's really rooted in, in, in a day-to-day -day life and faith and mm -hmm. people with their prayers and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, we've talked about some of the challenges that both the World Council of Churches and that we personally and certainly the future generations will face. Who and what inspire you? Hmm. Because that's well, what we need. We need yeah. inspiration mm -hmm. to face these things, to fa have the strength and the courage to, to look these things mm -hmm. straight on. Well, certainly my own local congregation has always been important to me. I've only belonged to two congregations in my life, and both of them have been really significant for me. And uh, as much as possible when I'm home, I try to go to a lectionary group that meets in my congregation Explain in Explain a little bit about what a luxury group would be. Well, we meet on uh, Tuesday morning, and there's anywhere between six and ten of us who meet, and we look at the readings that will be used as the basis for uh, for the worship the following Sunday. So Bible readings. Bible study, mm-hmm. Uh, what's good about the Bible? Tell me what's oh. good about the Bible. <laughs> oh, well, first of all, I've come to appreciate um, the Hebrew Scriptures much more than I once did. I mean, the wonderful stories about the human condition, you know, that are there, and the kind of courage and faith and persistence that, uh, that people have. And, uh, and of course, the inspiration of, uh, of, the, of the gospel is really, is really very significant. For, for a congregation to have, even if it's just a small group of people who come together and really try to make the connection between those readings and what's happening in their own lives mm -hmm. or the lives of people they know about or what's going on in the world. I think it just en enriches what happens on Sunday. And I know for our minister, whoever that's been, has always said that to have that chance to be together with some people from a congregation really is inspiring to that person when they preach on Sunday. So it's kind of a cyclical thing. Well, I, I, and I'm actually, I'm going to sort of step out of my role here as the interviewer and just say I agree 100%. I mean, I just think the Bible is a fabulous book. Yeah. I often call it a book of choices. Uh -huh. People make choices about their own lives, their relationship with others, their understanding of God. It's not naive about human behavior. I mean, no. it's got as much <laughs> dirt and sleaze as anything you could find on TV. Yeah. Um, and yet at the same time, it is just, and I think it's meant, not meant to be read individually. No. I mean, that's one way to read it, but primarily as a group, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. Yep. 
So I think it's that and it's people, uh, I mean, I've been just so richly blessed over the years with people who just seemed to be there at the right time, who mentored or encouraged me in a whole variety of ways and who, and who were an inspiration to see how they lived out their faith. Now, to be really honest, I have not had any what I would call really serious difficulties in my life. Mm -hmm. And so my faith probably hasn't been tested the way a lot of people's has. So I, I hope that it will deep, be deep enough. I've, I don't think I've ever had a lack of faith, but I've certainly had uh, ups and downs with the church. I mean, mm -hmm. times when I've just... Thank goodness. Yeah, yeah. I <laughs> Thank mean, goodness, you know. that's, uh, that really does go up and down, yeah. you know, and, and I just think, oh, you know, are we about anything that's really faithful? And then the next thing I think, oh, isn't this great? You know, and, of course, if, yeah. if you really care about something, I mean, you do have to have ups and downs. I mean, yeah. life is made of ups and downs, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But I think it's people that I've known and, uh, and the study and um, a prayer life that uh, has been significant for me too. Um, I, I try every day to have a period of just silence. And um, I learned a long time ago, it was back in the 70s, a course I took with Jim Crookshank oh. at VST, that it was important just to be silent and to wait. Wow, we're out of time, but thank you for this conversation. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks, Brad. Yeah. I've been talking with Dr. Marianne Best, who is a Vice Moderator of the World Council of Churches, past moderator of the United Church of Canada, and a faithful Christian. Thanks for joining us on Pressure Point. I'm Brad Newcomb.